Ahoy, hoy, everybody. Hello. Hi. Sasha here, and I've got Vera, and we're going to have some fun. Sorry, first and foremost, ever so sorry about the technical difficulties. Uh, they happen to every entrepreneur, every business owner, and you know it had to happen today because I'm hungry and I want to talk about scones. So, of course, of course, my technology fails. But thank you so much for, for popping on and joining us and for working through um, and being patient with us today. Uh, so I'm going to start by introducing Vera Hyder. Now, she runs Seven Sisters Scones with her other six sisters. I had to practice that line. That's too many S's. <laughs> so she runs Seven Sisters Scones with her sisters. That's where she, she started her entrepreneurial journey. So we're going to chew in and dive in on that one a little bit. And then she's actually embarking on a really cool new journey as well, uh, which I get to, get to be a part of. And we're going to talk about how she's attacking that and how it's different from what she's doing now. So first things first, here, say hi to everybody. Hello, so happy to be here today. Very excited. Right, and doesn't she look pretty? She looks so pretty today. So tell us, uh, tell us about Seven Sister Scones and more importantly, why scones? So Seven Sister Scones, it's a modern bakery. We take a modern take on scones. Um, they're more moist, less dry than your traditional scone. Um, we're here in Johns Creek, Georgia. We ship nationwide. And the story really started with my sister wanting to feed her family a very quick and nutritious meal. So she baked her first scone. And it just kind of snowballed from there. Everybody kept saying, oh, can you make this flavor, that flavor, that flavor? And then, you know, suddenly she had 20 different flavors of scones. So we ended up going to a farmer's market. And it so we sold a lot. And we're like, you know, we think we have a business here. I was living in Boston at the time. And she called me, she said, I'm serious. I'm going to move into my own kitchen. Would you move, you know, from Boston to Georgia? And I was under about nine feet of snow. And I looked at her and I said, I don't know, move to sunny Georgia? Yes, I think so. <laughs> um, so I ended up moving to Georgia and it's been almost three years now. Wow. It's been a, a really wild ride. And, um, you know, I have an, an MBA in marketing and entrepreneurship, but I have never learned more than doing this um, because I used to I used to have my own business in marketing but I was an agency which is selling a service rather than a manufactured a product. product. <laughs> totally different. Well yes yeah. totally different. Um, so it's been a journey. Yeah. Well, I imagine it's been a journey. Now realizing that you you went from the service business which of course I understand I'm in the service business um, yeah know all about that <laughs> but you you then pivoted and you decided okay I'm going somewhere warm and I'm gonna make scones mm -hmm. um, and not only any scones like some of the best scones ever um, speaking of which please don't forget we need to talk about getting them to me uh, but nonetheless <laughs> so when you decided to make that big pivot what was the first thing, like what was that first step for you? Because I know that there's a lot of people out there that may be considering doing the same shift, but it's like, I mean, that's two different mindsets entirely. How, what was the first thing that you did to say, okay, this is how we're gonna start our brick and mortar manufacture business? Okay, so I gotta tell you, um, the first thing that I did was I immersed myself in the operations part of it. And that sounds very counterintuitive for someone who's in marketing. Because you think in marketing, you kind of tend to be hands off. You know, you come up with the messaging, et cetera. How that gets fulfilled, that's someone else's business. Well, when you're doing a product-based business, you have to understand it all. Because you have to know what they're capable of, what's special about the product, how are we different. Um, so I immersed myself in operations. There were many, many mornings and nights I spent scooping scones, packaging them, baking them with my sister, understanding that. And the most enlightening conversation I had with her once was, I walked in and I said, oh, I think I got a lead. You know, I, we could sell, you know, I don't know, about 10,000 scones a week. And she's looking at me. She's like, are you going to be hand scooping those? And I'm like, oh, yeah, I'm not in services anymore. Because in services, you walk in like I was in high tech. So a lot of the work was done up front, right? You coded right. the product. The minute you had a functioning software, it was like, go and sell millions of dollars worth. We're yeah. good, right? You can't do that with a manufacturing business. You have to really manage your growth organically, slowly. You have to understand the capabilities of your operation. You have to have a very deep understanding of cash flow, right? How that works. 
because often you're putting out the money and the effort and everything before you're getting paid. Yep. Um, and really, with products, it comes down to pennies. You know, it's the nitty gritty. Do I use, you know, what the bags that we use, etc. So that was a definite mind shift for me. Um, and I think the only way you can do it is to really and truly immerse yourself in the operations, and not just your operation, by the way. Like one of the things when I was before I went down here, when I was in Boston, I actually wanted to open a coffee shop. Oh, so wow. I went and worked in a barista as a barista in a coffee shop. I mean, here I was, you know, I had my own marketing agency, et cetera, but three days a week, I would go into a small local coffee shop, work as a barista, deal with customers, see how they manage their operations. And then I also convinced a couple of coffee shop owners to actually open their books for me and let me look at what driving costs, right? Um, and I was smart enough not to get in, into it by myself. Because in this business, particularly, it's very hard to survive if you're a sole operator. So um, that's when I said immerse yourself in the operations, especially your own and other people's. Learn as much as you can. And by the way, here's one key thing. Don't think you're different. <laughs> you are not different. The, and I know everybody thinks, oh, but my story will be different. Your story's not going to be different. The realities of the industry are not going to change. The costs are not going to change for you. You are not some special unicorn. You are yeah. going to have to deal with the realities of what it is. Maybe you can do it better. I'll give you that. But a lot of people just say, oh, well, you know, they did that, and they told me not to do this, but I'm going to be different. No, you're not. <laughs> you're not different. And I mean, th there's something to be said, especially in service-based um, industries, there's something to be said for doing things differently, being disruptive. Like, that is something that we often strive for in the service-based industry, whereas when you're dealing with manufactured products, and, and I mean, I think of manufactured products almost in the same way as you would a recipe. You've got to have the same pieces every time. It's got to be put in the right places. It's got to be the right amount. Or it work. Yeah. To do it not just once but a hundred times a day over and over and over and over again over um, and over and over and over <laughs> yeah. you know and it, it it really becomes old school like I remember when I was in my you know my doing my bachelor's in business at the time and we sat there and did operations and I was like oh god I'll never be in operations because I don't want to do this every single day but that's what you know but the the beauty is in finding the perfection of the system oh you yeah know what I mean perfecting the system, fine-tuning. Um, if you want to be the person that's driving a new car every week, doing a new project every week, this isn't for you. Right. You're in this business, you are restoring the old classic to a thing of new beauty. You know what I mean? Yep. Um, and that's a very different mindset. And, but I mean, even with uh, those of us in, in services, there's a lot that we can extract and use from that. I mean, you've got to have everything down to your basic processes before you can even start. And I feel that a lot of us entrepreneurs, if we did the same thing and we had our processes in place before we start, we'd probably get a lot further. <laughs> um, what, what are you, what's your take on it? Because now you're going first from the PR and marketing, and then you went into scones, and now you're going to be starting your new journey um, because it, you you have so much to give, and you're really going to want to give that back. So, what are you like? Are you bringing these pieces all the way through? I mean, yes, of course, there's going to be a difference between physical and services, but there's got to be themes that are carrying through that you've noticed. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Like, you know, one of the things that struck me as a marketing when I did um, was part of a market agency is we treated every customer like they were different and they are you know the projects etc but there are some basic onboarding steps right there's a lot of operational paperwork logins um, social media tasks etc that tend to be repetitive and if you can find a way to automate those that'll be the difference of adding one or two clients to your roster and you know, adding one or two clients to your roster just means more bottom line. I mean, in the end, you guys do have something that's finite. Like me, you know, I have finite materials, finite yeah. staffing, et cetera. You guys have finite time. Yeah, that's true. Oh, yes, we do. Right? So it's different in the sense that it, it, it feels like, you know, the only way you can add time is by replicating yourself, basically training somebody. I can hire new people. Yeah. I can buy maybe more materials, invest in more space. My And the challenge with me is that, it's a step function, right? 
you have to buy X amount of materials, X amount of space. So you have to quickly, you know, push up revenue versus yeah. you, you can do, you know, I'll, I'll hire someone for 20 hours a week to kind of extend my time. But the truth is, and I think one of the pivotal things for many, many marketing agencies and consultants is you start off, it's only you, you're one-on-one -on -one with every customer, and then you're growing, and your time starts tightening, right? And, you start, and then you automate these tasks, but your time's still tightening. It's like, how do you move it to the point where you can become the overseer and not the executor? And that becomes a very interesting shift because it's a shift for you, and it's a shift for your customers. Absolutely, and it's they want, tricky. They wanna to talk to you. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and guys, if you're out there and you're one of those businesses that is doing this transition, please reach out to me. This is something I deal with every day. Um, and I'm more than happy to give you some of my insight on it as well. But you're completely right. It's it's a it's a shift in perspective, but it's not. I mean, there's still common themes and commonalities. Now, we've got a couple of audience questions. So excited. So the first one here is what is one piece of advice that you would give to a product style business who might be having troubles getting noticed or getting their product out there? Okay. So here's uh, that is an excellent question, Russell. So here's what I would say. One of the things we get caught up in, I'm guilty of this, I'm actually now, I'm in what I'm calling um, current recovery from this, right? Is we focus too much on the product. And I'm gonna use the age old example of Coke because it's the best thing. What is Coke's product? It's black water with physics. <laughs> yeah, yes. That's what Coke is, right? But whenever you say Coca-Cola someone, does anyone think of black water? No. No, what do they think of? Freedom, lifestyle, maybe that, right? That sound. Right. The polar bears. The polar bears. You Definitely. think of all these lifestyle things. And if actually, if you read some of Coca Cola's material, they never say they're a beverage company. They're a marketing and branding company. Yep. So, my thing is when you want to get noticed, if you're just focused on scones, for example, for example, whatever widget that you're saying, and you're doing all these fascinating things with it. It's still only about that. You've got to expand what it is about, right? So for me, right now, we're actively going through this process. For us, it's about community, lifestyle, giving. And, you know, we have this new tagline, like, we're traditionalists who know how to break the rules. Um, and now we're going to start to convey that in our marketing communications by honestly not featuring the product as much and featuring the lifestyle around it. Good. Right? What it means to be someone who loves our product, who loves our store. It means much more than just, you know, a great baked product. And you know when it really hit me? It hit me because I actually took my kids to the world of Coke and I was sitting there tearing up in their advertising section and I'm like, it's dark water, why am I feeling this way? Because they do the lifestyle thing so well. Yeah, they do. But the thing is, one of my customers called me and he said, hi there, I'm like, hi, how are you? And he's like, I just wanted to let you know, I have a doctor's appointment today, so I'm going to be late tonight. He comes in every Thursday at 10 a.m. And he's like, I'm going to be late. Don't worry about me. And I just pause, and I'm like, no. I'm like, you know what? We would have worried about you. And that's something that I have to communicate. So yeah. that would be my communication. You know, do something funky, sweet, nice with your product. New, Take a new angle at it and really start to communicate not just about the product but about what it means to be a consumer of this product. Yeah, and that, I mean, that fits right in with the trends that we're seeing right now because everything in marketing is, go, you know, make it about the people that you're serving. It's about them, it's not about you. I mean, there's been big pivots in marketing that way. Um, and, and, and that's what, what, what you're really talking about. I have to tell you, too, this millennial generation is especially in tune with that. They and are. I want to give you an example. I was talking to my niece once, and she is a big follower of Sean Mendes. I don't know if you know who he is. He's a pop singer. <laughs> big follower. But she knew him when he was putting out his initial Vine videos, which is how he got famous. Right. And I remember I, listening to her talking with a friend. She said, I knew him when he was still on Vine, and I believed in him then. Right? Everybody yeah. loves a story. And everybody and journey. was part of something great. So take your community, make them part of something great. Don't try to be like, you know, we tend to be like, the minute we get into, I call it business mode, right? We're all formal, we talk in big words, you know, and we're, we don't want to show anybody our weaknesses. We want to be perfect all the time. But it's yep. not real. 
and it doesn't resonate. No. You want to resonate with your customers? I go out to my customers and say, hey, we have QVC this weekend. We are straight out, can't take catering. I'm so sorry. And they go, and they're like, go for it. And they'll call me like, how'd it go? Do you want me to come in and bag some scones for you? You know, like they're invested. And when you're invested, that's when they'll talk about you. And honestly, best marketing ever. I agree wholeheartedly. It's the same thing that I do. I mean, well, you know. <laughs> um, and it's it's the way to go. Focus on the people and what you're going to do for them and how you're going to serve them and how you're going to meet your promises. And that's mm -hmm. how you really grow. So I, I love it. And we've got another really awesome question that I want to jump into. Um, and actually, it's funny because I did this. So I, <laughs> I would love to hear your take. So what are your thoughts on the idea of rebranding within your first year of business, especially when you're working with a product? Or series of products. So, okay, rebranding. By, <laughs> what do you mean by rebranding? Because a lot of people say rebranding, and not all they mean is changing the logo. Do you mean rebranding or changing the mission? I, I see. Based on, I know who that is. So I'm, I'm gonna say it's probably an actual like rebranding the whole thing, the look, the feel, what customers are connecting with, uh, because I know that. In a lot of cases, especially when I'm talking to business owners, they talk to me, oh, I want to refresh my brand. Those are the problems that they're always trying to solve is that people aren't connecting with their message and they're not making the sale. Okay. I would say do it. And the reason why I say do it is you want to fail fast and fail forward, right? Yes. Have you ever have fail fast, fail forward. If you're working on something and you don't feel like it's resonating and you know why, change it. Yep. You haven't invested, if you're within a year, you haven't invested any time into branding, really branding, I mean really getting entrenched in someone. And then why would you continue to you know, pour your efforts into something that's not working? Yep. You know? Rechange it, change it, tweak it, you know, keep tinkering. I think the first five to ten years of business, is all you're doing is tinkering. You're tuning up, right? You're rebranding that old classic over and over and over again until you get it right. Yeah, exactly. And I, I and that's something that maybe a lot of business owners and a lot of entrepreneurs don't think of at first because they're like, oh, I'm starting out brand new. I want to throw all my money into getting this done. I don't know what I want. And now three months later, it's not working. I don't like it. And oh my God. Um, so I think you're right. Fail, fail often, fail forward, fail freaking fast. And yeah. yeah, if you're in those first, you know, one to I I, I usually say one to five. Ten. Yeah. After a couple of years, you usually have a good idea. Usually you know, not. Yeah. Usually. But, but you sometimes know, up until, you get those, you know, medium successes, right? Yeah. You're like, well, and up until cool. you start seeing that generation, it's, I mean, you can't say, yes, this works. And so it's those people who are committing to the wrong thing and being unwilling to change that are going to struggle. Whereas the rest of us who are like, yeah, you know what? Rebranding your first year twice if you yeah. need to. Find the message that works, right? One hundred percent. Yeah. So speaking yes. about finding messages, you are currently, I, I mentioned this earlier, but you're starting your journey because you've got this wealth of information. You've been doing um, product sales for a long time. You used to be on the service side and now you're going to take this out. And if you really want to start generating um, things to help other people in the same position. So you're you're striving to become more of a thought leader. Why don't you talk mm -hmm. to our audience a little bit about what that looks for you and and where you started your journey? Well, I've always, since I was a young, really young kid, want, loved to teach, right? I was that kid that would start study group and like be the one teaching everything. And when I came into the to this, one of the things that when we started actually Seven Sisters School, we were also a shared kitchen. And one of the ideas was that by sharing kitchen, we would help educate other food entrepreneurs. Now, as we grew, we don't we don't have the time to give in our kitchen anymore, so that's kind of fizzled out. And but I still get a lot of questions from people starting food companies and I always just want to reach out and hug them and tell them you know what it's gonna be okay here's all the mistakes I made don't make them you know because I know you're gonna make them <laughs> just like I did yeah um, and here's like I could I could totally accelerate your process if you just gave me you know an hour to my time of your time so when I started thinking like that I said you know I really miss that part of especially when I was in the agency, I did a lot of education, onboarding of clients, et cetera. So I miss that, that part of my life now where I don't get to educate and share anymore. So I thought, you know what? I can blog, I can write, 
and I can just put this out there and whoever wants to, you know, read about it, I'm, I'm happy to. And you know what, what really surprised me is I actually is how many people don't take you up on that offer. Yeah. I can't tell you the other day I was on Twitter and somebody was tweeting towards, you know, this big celebrity business person and they were like, Oh, you know, how can I do this for shipping? And I just replied to them. I said, I'm shipping, you know, nationwide, made a ton of mistakes. We've been on QVC. I know a lot about it. DM me. I'm happy to spend an hour with you on the phone. And a lot of people just don't. And I don't understand why. So I said, okay, maybe I'll just put it out there in a blog. And if you want to, you know, read it, you're welcome to. That's so exciting. I cannot wait for that to uh, to go live. Um, speaking of which, you owe me an email. <laughs> I thought I emailed. But, Anyways, we'll talk about that later. Yeah, we will. But um, so it's it's going to be really exciting. Now, if you guys want to follow along, want to check out what she's been doing with scones, or you want to order some, guys, I've I've actually known several people um, in our in our business mastermind group who have used these to gift to clients with resounding success like these are some of the best scones you'll ever eat so if you, if you want to try them and i do recommend it there we go seven sisters scones.com easier and to say but i can do it and i will give you guys that we have one um one product the sweet and savory sampler that is on special right now if you use coupon code give 25 you'll get 25 percent off and it's free shipping so can't beat that deal coupon code it's on the screen on the screen, give yep. 25 at Seven Sisters Scones. I like literally started to drool when you said that. Um, it's the sweet, it's only on one product. It's the sweet and savory scone sampler. So it has two savory, two sweets in it. 12 scones, best deal out there. Guys, go get some scones. Um, and then fa follow along. I'll be posting more about her journey as she goes through it because, you know, I, I wiggle my way into everything. And hopefully we can convince her to come back and tell you a little bit more about that. But definitely go and check it out. Give 25. And that's, again, on 7... <laughs> I can't do it. 7 Uh Any final parting words or, like, what's one thing that our audience could do today if they're going to drastically improve their manufactured marketing or business. Blah. Oh my God. It drastically improve their manufactured. Just, um, just one thing. There's always that one thing that everybody could use. Know <laughs> your costs intimately. It's really know your costs. Intimate. And by knowing your costs, don't be afraid to price as you should. I think a lot of food people are afraid to price as they should, but price it. If you're the right customer will, will pay the price that you need them to pay because they get the quality. Exactly. It's about the quality. Um, nobody, I mean, don't, don't try to compete with the people who are selling like 50 cent scones, right? There's no point. Let's go after the people who want the quality well, the same way you do, right? I, mean, I have people that come and say, well, I could go to Panera and get a dozen for like three or $4. And I said, you know what? There's a Panera. If you drive down left, make a left, there's a Panera right there. You're welcome to do that. I'm sorry. I can't do that. Because I don't use what Panera uses. Yeah. And um, a lot of people just pause and they go, okay, I get it. You know what I mean? And especially in the food business where your costs are affected by everything. You know, McDonald's decides to use real butter, suddenly you're paying double for a case. Yep. It happens. Yeah, it does. But you know what? It actually does happen even when you're in, you know, products. It, like products is versus versus surfaces, uh, it doesn't really matter which side you're on, that the same could be said, things shift all the time. I mean, I could have a competitor come out with an amazing website package that kicks my butt, um, but until you see it work out in the wash, you never know. And being true to that that quality piece is really what's helped you excel, it's what, what has helped me excel. And guys, if you're out there, hey, you could use it too. And <laughs> The real question is, do they have blue hair? Wow. <laughs> nobody no can nobody be, can be quite as fabulous as Sase, but no. <laughs> um, also blue hair is not for the faint of heart, uh, and it just works with my personality. Um, just remember that if you go blue hair, you may have to deal with, mommy, look, she's blue. So keep that in mind. Um, and with that, guys, if you want to follow Farah, um, of course, she is on Facebook. It's at Seven Sisters Scones right now until she gets her next batch of stuff set up. Um, and it's sevensisterscones.com. Give 25 to get your awesome sampler. And I think I just rambled enough. Oh, my goodness. So thank you, everybody, for watching. Really appreciate it. And for all your comments, we'll talk to you guys soon. Talk to you guys soon. Thank you, Sasha.